All right, there we go. All right. Well, thank you to those who are tuning in uh, with whichever format uh, you guys are here on, whether it be YouTube or Facebook or all that. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment to pour myself a beer here while we wait. Uh, I figured I'll go with the uh, the barrel aged the barrel aged group. Um, so this is actually a, a beer from Tributary Brewing Company, which is located in Kittery, Maine. Todd Mott is, is a pretty well-known uh, brewer, uh, especially around New England. And this is his Mott the Lesser beer. And it's, it's, a, it's a really unique beer because it's a stout. And he brews it every year, twice a year. Uh, but, every, but what's different is every batch is aged in different barrels. Um, and this goes plays exactly into to the presentation of how, how oak is an ingredient. So every twice a year when this beer comes out, it's different. Um, and it's all because of the barrels. Uh, the, the base beer is the same. It's the barrels that he switches up. Uh, he comes up to the cooperage. We, we have a good chat, and we, and we kind of go through and we handpick uh, which four barrels he's going to put the beer in. And there are four separate barrels. Uh, and then every edition, he changes one of those barrels out for something different. So this is the, the quarantine edition of Mont the Lesser. Uh, and it is aged in port barrels, uh, Madeira barrels, cherry brandy, and rye whiskey barrels aged as, uh, um, uh, described as having an aroma complex with notes of baking pastry, toasted almonds, stone fruit. The oak character balances the qualities of a dessert wine and is complemented by the flavors of chocolate-like flourless cake, vanilla, toffee, and cherries. So cheers. I hope you guys are able to dive into something while we go through this. And actually, what I'm pouring it into is a uh, barrel-aged beer glass. Um, just to kind of nerd out a little bit more on barrel aged beers. Uh, this is from uh, Spiegelau. It's an actual, they have a bunch of uh, uh, style specific glasses. Uh, I own their uh, their Pilsner glasses for some slow pour pills at home, but they also have this barrel aged beer glass. And I drink a lot of beers out of this because it really does change the body of the beer. I, I, I'm not being paid or this is not an advertisement for them, but I just find how how a lot of the darker, heavier beers, which mostly are the barrel aged beers, but even a brown ale, porter, non aged stouts, it really does really enhance the, the aromas and flavors that come from it. So it's pretty neat. So cheers. All right, we're gonna get rolling here. Um, luckily, I don't need my mask from our, for our social distancing. Uh, but if you would like a cover your bunghole mask, <laughs> send me an email. I'll have my email address posted later. It's matt at riverdrive.co, matt at riverdrive.co. I've got a whole little swag bag. So anyone who tunes into this, if you want the swag bag, I will mail it to you because what's a trade show without swag, of course. Uh, you'll get a cover your bunghole mask uh, as well as some other stuff. So send me an email to matt at riverdrive.co and um, I need your name and address and we'll send you off a package of swag. Uh, give, me, give me a couple days to get it off to you. So what we're going to talk about here is, is oak and how it really plays in as an ingredient, just like all the other ingredients we use, the hops, the grains, and how it can really have an impact in what you're making, but also the different options we have. You know, it's not just barrels. So uh, River Drive is the name of the cooperage. Barrels Direct is the name of our website. So bear with me. This is a little bit of a plug, but Barrels Direct is really meant to kind of give you literally the one-stop resource for everything oak aging. Um, yes, you can buy barrels on it. I would love for you to buy barrels off of it, of course. However, uh, you know, like I always say, I don't need your money to, to help. There's tons of resources on there. There's contact forms on there. So please, you know, use it to reach out. If you have any questions, you don't have to buy anything or spend a dime. Just if you if you need help or have any questions, I'm always happy to help. There's a ton of resources and videos on there. Uh, later on today, um, we're actually going to do a real quick uh, barrel inspection process demonstration before the panel discussion around 4.50 p.m. So I, I love providing this education uh, because, like I said, there's so much 
that can go right with barrel aging. There's so much that can go wrong. And I love providing as much of resources and education as I can. And we love doing these uh, seminar and conference sessions, these kind of one hour sessions. But we also offer much more involved cooperage classes and seller technician classes. So this is a half day class. And then we also have our full day class, the seller cooper, which is a ton of uh, classroom learning about the, the fundamentals of barrel aging, the history of the barrels, and, and a lot of the science that goes into it. And then also in the seller cooper portion, we get to go hands on and we get to start breaking apart barrels, putting them back together, damaging them on purpose, which is fun, but also fixing them, which really just shows you how to really tackle any problem that you may encounter when it comes to barrel aging. Because we know it's not always perfect. It's not a perfect world. So another thing we're doing for the show, uh, since you guys are tuning in, um, uh, we're doing a show special. So $9.99, including shipping for any of our barrels, um, any of these on here for a full pallet's worth. So $9.99 includes shipping a pallet worth of barrels. Screenshot this, send that over, and you can uh, certainly take uh, good care of the deal, uh, uh, take advantage of the deal on here as well. So moving forward, we have a lot of variables when it comes to oak aging. We have different formats, we have different toast levels, we have different char levels, sometimes these are combined. We have different wood species, we have the entry proof, uh, which goes into a lot, explains a lot of the difference between barrel aging a whiskey versus barrel aging a beer. Um, and then we also have the time that we have contact with the oak and weather and seasons do, do play a, a pretty big role in this as well. So the cask size is our first big thing. Now, this is if we're going into a barrel, like this cask size will play a big role because the smaller the barrel, the greater the surface area. Now, I, I hate to say that the smaller the barrel, the faster it ages, because at the end of the day, we can't speed up time. Time is time. Uh, and six months aged in a tiny barrel versus six months aged in a big barrel is still six months aged. But what you're going to see here is the, uh, I'm not sure if my pointer shows up. Oop, I got a pointer right here. Um, so what you're going to see here is the ASB barrel is the American standard barrel. This is what we know of as a, uh, a, a whiskey barrel, a bourbon barrel, a 200 liter barrel. Um, and this is the, one of the most common ones that we have. Then we have our wine barrels and those bariques, which can be about 220, 225 liters, depending on the maker. Um, a lot of times, punchins are generally referred to anything 300 liters or greater. Uh, butts are very famous from our port, our, excuse me, our sherry uh, and scotch butts. We have our port pipes, which port isn't a lot. But generally, a, a lot of the anything over the 300 liters is really just going to be called a punchin. Uh, and then really once we get over this thousand liter mark or the ton is when we really start to refer to them as, as folders or tanks instead. Um, the hogshead you'll notice is the same height as an ASB. And the reason behind that is because a hogshead, which is uh, mostly used in the scotch industry, it is actually simply they take five ASBs, they take five standard bourbon barrels and they make three hogsheads out of them. So they take the staves and they just make a fatter barrel uh, and to hold to hold more whiskey. Um, so we have more than just barrels. So we've all heard, or heard of you know adjuncts and alternatives. So we've got chips and we've got cubes. And, and these also come, just like barrels, these come in a variety of sizes. Chips can come you know, from anything uh, from from big giant like smoking chunks that people use for making meats all the way down to almost pencil shavings and powder uh, the really fines of the chips we, we generally provide a, a large number of different sizes but the medium size is kind of really what, what you what you would find in uh, your average like homebrew supply store um, it's the it's the popular chip size some people like the smaller ones because they're actually pumpable uh, they can go through a pump without getting clogged or causing damage um, but, but also with a chip surface area, just like the barrel plays a huge role. So the smaller the chip, the more you use, the greater surface area you have, the bigger the chip, the less surface area, but it also allows you to have a lot of control over your aging and how much impact that you actually want to put in. And the chips can come as raw natural oak, 
uh, but they can also come uh, seasons with, with spirits. So it's just like you're aging in a barrel as well. Cubes are, I would classify them as being similar to chips, but the difference is you're going to notice the cubes is a very, uh, you know, normal shape. <laughs> um, every, every single cube is the exact same shape. And the reason why, you know, this is going to be, this is going to be a lot more consistency. You're going to get a lot more consistency in your flavor from the oak with your cube. And that's because if you order them to a specific toast level, they're all going to be the same. Every single cube is going to be toasted through and through to the same level, as opposed to, I'll back up to the chips here, our, our chips are all different sizes. And the, the easy way to describe this is if you uh, imagine having a steak, let's jump up to cubes here, you've got a, a beautiful ribeye, and it's exactly one inch thick um, all the way across, and you can throw that on the grill and you can cook that to a perfect medium rare uh, with not a problem. However, you take that same ribeye, but now let's say that uh, one end of the ribeye is only like a quarter of an inch thick and the other end of the ribeye is an inch and a half thick. Well, how are you going to cook that, ex that one piece of meat perfectly to a medium rare through and through? You're not. Your, 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 your thin end is going to be pretty much very well done while the really thick end is probably going to be more rare while your, your perfect medium is in the middle. That's similar with the chips. So the chips can't be as as toasted, you know, as um, controlled or as specifically as the cubes. Uh, but they are generally less expensive, and they do offer some of the other advantages that we discussed. So, and a lot of these are also available in, in various woods, mostly French oak and American oak, and then the toast levels of light, medium, uh, medium heavy to a heavy heavy, or a plus plus, as some manufacturers call them. And, and both the chips and cubes, like I mentioned, can, can come uh, either natural or they're seasoned with spirits. So you can still get that used barrel, uh, you know, that used bourbon barrel, used rum barrel uh, note with it. So our toast level. We talked about toasting. Um, this is cooking the wood. Now back to the steak example. Not only is it delicious, uh, but um, when you cook a steak, it tastes different. When you if you were to eat raw steak, it's going to taste very much different than if you're going to eat a, you know, well done steak or a medium uh, cooked steak. Uh, and while while the light and the heavy toast here all all you know taste all right, um, it's they're going to put off different flavor uh, profiles. So as we cook the wood, we actually perform chemical reactions within it, just like in our food, that breaks down different aspects of it and actually creates uh, the thermodynamic kind of breakdown of, of all these different fibers, creates these different flavors. Kind of like how we get a nice uh, toasted almond from a light and then a heavy, charry, smoky flavor from, from the heavy toast. Now, a lot of this is kind of the proprietary information, the specific temperatures that these are cooked to. Um, that a lot of the different cooperages and manufacturers, uh, you know, keep keep their secrets, but they do advertise the flavor profiles that their different toast levels are supposed to provide. Now, moving from toast into char, very much, uh, very similar. We have different char levels. We have our number one char, which is kind of our light char, and, and enough, you know, it's kind of the next step beyond a heavy toast. But then we also go all the way up to our number four alligator char. Now this is the same exact thing. The more we cook the wood, the more we change the flavor. So what is also happening though, that a lot of people don't really realize, but it makes a lot of sense is when you're charring the wood, you're actually also toasting layers of the wood deeper inside. So much in the same reason how, uh, you know, in the middle of the uh, winter, for example, the outside of your house is probably 32 degrees. But then, you know, a, but inside the wall, just a few inches, it's a nice toasty 65 degrees or 70 degrees, depending on who's paying the heating bill. So the wood acts the same way. While the, while the, the, the surface of the wood is being charred, a little bit deeper inside of the wood, it's actually being heavily toasted. And a little bit deeper inside the wood there, it's being lightly toasted. So you actually get a lot of these flavors. And this is why as you let your 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 products soak into the wood more and more and more, you're, you're 
bringing all these different flavors out. Now, if you just take a, a, a more freshly charred barrel and you just dump your product into it and let it sit in there for a couple of days and pull it out, all, all you're going to taste is that char, that, that smoky, that burn. That's all you're going to taste. But this is why as you let it age in the barrel for longer, it starts to really get through those layers of the charcoal, which also act as a filter. Uh, that every, if anyone has a water filter attached to their sink, a lot of times that's a charcoal filled filter. Um, but it gets through to those toasted layers. A lot of some cooperages will actually toast their barrels first on purpose to to really make sure that that layer is is good and solid behind the char level. But at the end of the day different temperatures are going to penetrate differently into the wood. And we're going to get into the different temperatures later and how it has an effect. So we're toasting barrels, we're charring barrels. Why? We talked about how it's kind of like cooking our food, how it changes the flavors. And that's, it, it changes the flavors, but it also releases some flavors. So we release flavor compounds by opening up the wood. We're, we're cracking the wood. We're creating these fissures in the wood. Um, you know, when you when you have a log on the fire burning and you hear it snapping and popping, that's what we're doing. We're, we're opening it up so your your the spirits and the the wines and the whiskeys and the beers can all get deeper deeper into the wood. But we're also creating flavor compounds, and we're going to talk about the specific compounds in a little bit of what we're creating. But but the fourth thing is we're creating that natural charcoal filter that I mentioned, and that's going to help actually remove flavors that we don't want. So we're not only getting flavors that we want from this uh, charred wood, but we're actually taking flavors away. So about these flavor compounds, we've got oak lactones. And this is just the best way to describe it is oak. When you think oak and the flavor of oak, it's the oak lactones that you're thinking of, just that raw oak, coconutty kind of flavors. We have our vanillin. You may recognize the word. Um, and this is an aldehyde that's actually from the breakdown of the wood. And this is the um, a main compound of natural vanilla. Uh, so this is comes from after the tree is, is cut down and the wood is seasoned before they build a barrel or build these adjuncts out of it. It's that breakdown of the lignin within the wood um, that's creating vanilla, which is where we get our vanilla flavors from. Uh, eugenol, a, another phenol that's actually produced by the oxidative breakdown of the lignin. So this is, again, during that air drying process. So a tree, a big round tree in the forest, doesn't get a tremendous amount of oxygen penetration to the, to the heart of it. But you cut that tree down and now you, you mill up the boards. So now all the, the boards of the tree are all separated and you get that oxygen to really permeate around it while it dries. It's breaking down more of the wood, and this is what produces some of these spicy and clove aromas that we're familiar with. Our gyacol is a, another phenol, and this is actually from thermal breakdown of the aldehydes that we we're um, just talking about. So this is from heating the wood. This is what we're what we're getting when we're cooking the wood. This is what we're making, um, and the. This is why we kind of uh, classify this a lot, a lot with the smoky aromas or the chari aromas, but it also plays into a lot of the spicy characteristics that come from a freshly um, charred uh, barrel uh, and more of a new one, which I know is not overly popular in the brewing side, but explains to us a lot of where these flavors come from that we later will find in our used bourbon barrels, so on and so forth. Our fur for all is produced by a breakdown of the carbohydrates during the, the heating, the toasting process. So this is going to be, um, you're going to notice that these are sweeter flavors, these butterscotch, caramel, faint almond flavors. This is why a toasted product is going to be a little bit sweeter. This is why if you leave your product in a charred barrel and you give it time to soak into that toasted layer, you're going to start to pull out those sweeter flavors. And this is, Again, by the breakdown of the carbohydrates that when they're heated during the toasting process. But if we get to a charring, then we're kind of we're getting the, the gyacol. Uh, so we're burning these off and we're we're going to get more spicy char. So that's kind of the differences here between our layers of the wood that are charred versus toasted and why we can choose to have our cubes and chips just toasted or charred or both. So here, if you look closely, this is uh, 
going left to right its uh, temperature range, um, and then it compares to the flavors that we're going to get from the wood over time, um, time and temp. So that oaky, coconutty, that purple, that first one there, we see low temp. Low temp, uh, more toasting temperatures uh, is where we're going to get more of our raw oak flavors from, the wood that isn't as affected by the heat. Now we start to go a little bit longer, and we notice that 300 to 400 range, we start to get that sweet butterscotch. Uh, that, so that is our, our, our light to medium toasting range where we are starting to break down those carbohydrates and create that, that nice sweet flavors. Now, if we keep moving forward and we get into 400 to 500 range, we start to get those spicy clove uh, notes as well as our vanillin. And then once we really get uh, beyond that into the hottest, into the charring uh, is where we get our smoky, our toasty uh, notes with a, with a little bit of that spicy clove as well. But if you kind of look, look at this in reverse, so imagine that this diagram right here is a barrel stave and you have that green toasty and smoke uh, flavor that that's the, the surface of your stave of the barrel stave that was just charred. And now you start to go in a little bit deeper to that barrel stave and you're gonna have flavors that are more spicy, clove-like, then some vanillin, then you're a little bit deeper to the stuff that wasn't charred as heavy, more toasted, you're gonna get your, your, your butterscotch, your sweetness. And then once you kind of get in the middle of that stave um, where the wood wasn't affected really at all by the heat or very little by the heat, that's when you're just gonna get more of your, your oaky, coconutty flavors. And this goes hand in hand to to exactly how the aging process works, like I mentioned before. At first, we're just gonna get our super smoky uh, or, or toasty flavors, but if we, as we let the, the product in that barrel longer, we're gonna have these flavors start to evolve because our product's soaking deeper and deeper into the wood and pulling these products out with it. And, I've, and, and this, um, uh, and I've had people report exactly this over and over again that, that, you know, yeah, they, they, they let it in there for a nice long time and it gets sweet, but then they let it, they leave it in there for too long and they start to just get this general wood oaky character, um, which is because it's, it's getting to that layer of the wood. So another, another um, this is kind of the, the same uh, graph we just looked at, it just presented a little bit differently. Um, so for the, for the visual learners out there, which I am very much of, it's just another way of, of providing the information. So. You know, you have your untoasted uh, wood, and that's very much your coconutty woody. And as you start to get your light toast, medium toast, heavy toast, we start to change all the flavors with it um, that, that it's going to produce all the way to the chard, where we see the chard is going to be heavy in the spices, um, but, uh, but, but not so much in our, our coconut and woody flavors. And our vanilla and caramel sweetness is going to kind of be somewhere in, in the middle. So talking more about these flavors that we're getting, our oak lactones that we just talked so much about, this is a study that is done between three separate barrels. The dark blue barrel uh, is gonna be a brand new bourbon barrel never used before. The second barrel is gonna be a uh, brand new barrel. And this is all, all beer, by the way. So this is specific to beer. A brand new barrel never used before that is filled with beer. Then we have the, the middle column, which is the, the medium blue. Uh, the medium blue is going to be a bourbon barrel that was a fresh bourbon barrel, fresh emptied bourbon barrel, emptied of bourbon, and then it was filled with beer, which is much more common in the industry than just a brand new barrel filled with beer. And then our all the way to the right, our light blue is going to be a uh, a third use, essentially. It's a second use, but that meaning second use after bourbon. So that light blue is going to be a freshly emptied bourbon barrel that is then filled with beer one time and then filled with beer a second time. So a lot of people try and really get as many uses out of their barrels as they can. Um, and, and we're going to kind of explain here how those flavors all interact. So our oak lactones, which is what we just talked about as being more raw oak, not the, not the charred, not the toasted layers, but we're going to see that it's going to take us a lot of time to, to pull uh, the, these flavors out. Um, 
because of that because those layers are so deep in the wood, it's going to take us a few months to actually get there. But now you'll notice that the the brand new barrel, which is full of all kinds of its flavors, these oak lactones come out slower than the fresh emptied bourbon barrel. And the reason is the fresh emptied bourbon barrel already did a lot of the work for us. That fresh emptied bourbon barrel, that bourbon that was already in the wood, did the work of, of seeping its way into the wood, grabbing onto those oak lactones and then seeping its way back out of the wood, carrying them with it. And that's why we see here when we use a fresh emptied bourbon barrel, we're going to get a lot more of those oak lactones, those oaky flavors into it, as opposed to just using a brand new barrel. And, and, that, and that's exactly because if we use a brand new barrel, our beer has to work its way all the way into the wood and then all the way out of the wood in order to get those flavors in. But when you're using a fresh empty bourbon barrel, the bourbon already did the hard work for you. Moving on to vanilla. So the vanilla, a little closer to the surface. Uh, it's kind of somewhere in, in the middle. So that's why when we're using a brand new barrel, we're gonna get a spike in that flavor. Um, because um, a lot of it there is kind of easily accessible by, by our beer, but when we use our, our middle barrel there, our, our medium blue barrel, it's still gonna be present, but on a much slower, slower scale because some of this has already been taken away by the bourbon that was already in the barrel. But if we look all the way to the right, um, and, and the scientific study did have a few omissions due to a variety of reasons, so that's why you'll see some of the graphs aren't complete. But it really paints the picture well for us. And we see all the way to the right in that, that light colored, which is now a third use barrel essentially, um, gets really strong. But it only gets really strong after 13 months in the barrel. And that's because it had the time to really soak its way in and collect. Um, and, and the data tells us that uh, we would be just as strong in our first and second use barrels as well. But again, it had the time to seep into the wood and pick up those vanilla concentrations. Now, when we talk about the eugenol, and again, this is something that's um, from a breakdown of the air drying process. So when we're air drying boards, which parts of the board get, um, you know, have the most breakdown, have the most interaction with the oxygen, the outside of the board. So it's going to be the outsides, the edges of the boards have the most eugenol concentration. And that's why we, and we see that exactly right here. It's uh, very close to the surface. So we, that's that brand new barrel is where we're getting all those spicy and clove aromas in. And then when we start to use those middle and um, the middle, the, the medium blue and the light blue, we start to use those second and third use barrels. That's where it really starts to um, diminish significantly because that first product already wiped a lot of that out. Then we have our glycol that we talked about, and this is the breakdown of the aldehydes um, from thermal break thermal breakdown. So this is our the charring of the barrels. And again, we char the surface of the barrels, the surface of the, the staves of the wood gets charred, and that's why that's where is that's where the highest concentration of the glycol is going to be. So our first use really is going to take a lot of this away. And that's why when we use a freshly emptied bourbon barrel, if you notice, if you're following along in these graphs, you're getting much more of that oaky, boozy flavors and not smoky, spicy flavors. And that's because that smoky spiciness is already in the bourbon that was in that barrel previously. And we're only, have, we're only kind of collecting up uh, trace amounts of it uh, afterwards. And our fur for all, which is now the flavors that we get from toasting. We talked about the flavor, the difference between toasting and charring and the fla different flavors that come from it. And our toasting process produces the fur for alls, which are more of our sweet butterscotch, light caramel and, and, and almond flavors. Now, our second and third use barrels, we're still getting a lot of that. And this goes back to what we already talked about with that, with that chart of, of the toasting. Um, our brand new barrel, it has to, penetrate the wood. It, our product has to penetrate through the layers of the char to get all the way through into the layers of the toast to pick up these flavors and then carry them back out into our product. It can do that. And we see here, it does do that in a brand new barrel. But when we're using that freshly emptied bourbon barrel, the, again, the bourbon already did the work for us. The bourbon already penetrated through that wood, picked up a lot of those flavors and carried it forward. And that's why we're seeing this in 
uh, in much higher concentrations in that freshly emptied bourbon barrel that was then filled with beer, which is our medium blue uh, middle column. But now, after after time, you'll see that our our third used barrel, so um, bourbon first and then twice for beer, on that third use for beer, that, that's or the second use for beer, um, sorry, this does get a little confusing, but um, we see the longer we let it sit, it's actually going to start to, to, on its own, soak its way through or seep through and, and start um, pulling those flavors out as well on its own, in addition to what the bourbon already pulled out for it. So uh, to, to get back a little more, a little more broad picture of visual here, this is, these are four bourbon barrels that were filled. Uh, the top left is going to be, you know, fresh, freshly filled with bourbon within a, a few weeks. And then our top right is going to be four years old. Our bottom left is going to be a nine year old bourbon barrel. And our bottom right is going to be an 18 year old bourbon barrel. Now this is not just to demonstrate what happens with the angel share, um, which is a real thing. You do lose product. Uh, and this is why older whiskeys are usually more expensive. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're better. They may be better. That depends on your palate. But there's a lot less of it. This 18-year-old whiskey, that barrel is probably, what, a, a quarter empty. Um, and uh, that's a lot of real estate that it's taken up for 18 years. So, of course, the distillery has got to get their money. Their money's worth of it. So, um, but we also have our different flavor evolutions that go on here. So, we kind of see in that zero to four years, the bourbon's going to develop a majority of its amber color. And this is where we're going to get all the smoky and woody flavors to evolve. And that's this is based on a lot of the science that we just talked about. Now, fun fact, if the bourbon is aged um, older than four years, they don't require an age statement. So uh, if you age a bourbon for less than four years, you're required to say, uh, how long it's been aged. So you can age a bourbon in a charred oak, charred wood oak barrel for three seconds if you want, but you have to put that on the label that it was only charred for three seconds, uh, aged for three seconds. So, but again, short aging, smoky woody flavors, because that's the surface of the wood. Now we age a little bit longer, five to 10 years, like we talked about. Now the color is going to darken, and this is both from pulling more compounds out of the wood, but also, uh, the oxidation process that slowly occurs about three liters a year of oxygen that does make its way through the wood. So at, in this five to 10 years, this is where we're gonna start to draw these sugars from the wood, um, especially those carbohydrates that, the, that were breaking down, broken down in that charring and toasting process. These start to make their way into the product. So if you're trying to get this into your beer with a brand new barrel, it's gonna take you a long time. But if you're using fresh empty bourbon barrel, a five to 10 year old bourbon barrel is gonna do all the work for you. And you just fill the barrel and take advantage of all the deliciousness. So five to 10 years, this is where kind of our, our sweet fruity notes are gonna really start to start to come out into the spirit. Now, 10 plus years, the color is gonna to continue to darken mostly from oxidation, but what's gonna happen is a lot of these sweet and herbal notes are gonna to start to fade away also from the oxidation. And um, even then, once we get up to 12 to 15 year um, or older, the bourbon's really going to lose a lot of its complexity. And the reason we're talking about these bourbon barrels is because they're so popular for putting beer in. It's, it's all about what you're going to be shopping for as well, and what influences you want to have on your beer. So if you want an older bourbon barrel, that's that's great. But know that um, you just know know the the characteristics that you're going to get with it. So after that 12 to 15 years, you know, we find the bourbon does find, does it lose a lot of its complexity as they really start to fade and the, the flavors just kind of become more, more smooth, more woody. This of course does contribute to why a lot of people um, attribute smoothness to an older whiskey. Um, but uh, we do lose some of that sweetness as a result. And that's because we're, we're now, we're so deep into the wood and we're pulling so much of that raw oak untoasted out uh, that it's starting to kind of overpower what used to be the, the herbal and sweetness of it. So, um, you know, the when we talked about how the the weather can also have a, a major impact on this too. And now seasons, weather, and microclimate. And I throw that microclimate in there because it could be 
you could uh, have a drastic change in seasons outside of your brewery. But if your barrel room is always, say, 65 degrees, um, then your microclimate within a room is going to have an effect, a different effect on your barrels versus an open air aging. Now, we know in bourbon world in Kentucky and Tennessee, they just have these giant ware warehouses as pictured and they age their whiskeys in here for years and years and years and they're and they're more or less uh you know open to the changes in climate and humidity and temperature they get cool they cool down in the in the sun in the winter time and they warm up in the winter time uh, in the summertime pardon me but but think about where from a micro aspect these buildings where things are stored so if you have a, a basement in your house, for example, uh, imagine the temperature of your basement in the middle of, uh, you know, July. But now in that same day, right in the heart of July, in a bright, hot, sunny day, go up into your attic. And what's the temperature difference in just those couple floors between your basement and your attic? It's pretty substantial. So imagine these these seven and, and to nine story warehouses where we have we have this sunny side up here. Uh, all on the seventh floor that is just getting hit with the sun all summer long. But then we have the shady side down here on the right that all the way in the bottom floor that is necessarily. So even just in that one building, the barrels that are aging here are going to age so much differently. And this kind of, you can take this into your tap rooms and into your breweries in a lot of the same way. So if you have a lot of uh, temperature fluctuations in a certain area, and you store your barrels there and they're subject to those temperature fluctuations, your beer is gonna age differently in those barrels as opposed to people who may store them in, for example, a cold room where it's one temperature all the time or your tap room, which is more or less the same temperature all the time. Or maybe your tap room isn't, maybe your tap room is just a little bit on the cooler side in the winter time and a little bit on the warmer side in the summertime. But these do play a role. So, and keep in mind, we, uh, we gain or lose one PSI uh, of, uh, of pressure for every 10 degree fluctuation. So if your barrel is sitting in an environment that's 55 degrees and it has a little bit of head, uh, head space in that barrel from evaporation, that little bit of head space is going to, as that room and the barrel heats up to say 65 degrees, that little bit of head space is gonna now turn into a positive pressure of one PSI, which is, actually a, a decent amount for a barrel. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna encourage or force the beer into the wood faster and deeper. And then that whole barrel cools down from 65 down to 55, for example, we lose that PSI, that, that 10 PSI. And in some cases, maybe we almost create a vacuum in the barrel and it sucks that uh, liquid back out of the wood. So it's almost like a sponge where we're forcing the liquid in and then drawing it back out. And that in itself is going to dramatically impact the flavors and how soon and quickly we pick up different profiles within the beer. So to kind of put this all into another little nice little graphic, again, totally visual learner here. So our angel share is what evaporates. And this is going to happen in your beer too. Some people top, some people don't. Um, if you have a pellicle, don't disturb the pellicle is always my, always my uh, recommendation. But as we start to, to lose product due to evaporation, we're going to gain airspace. The more airspace we have, the more pressure differential we have in the changing of those temperatures. So also this blown up picture with all these little uh, atoms, it looks like, um, is explains why we actually, as we lose product from our barrel, we, we lose water at a faster rate than we lose ethanol. And this is why a lot of stuff will go up in ethanol content while it's aging. So the ethanol molecules in red are about 10 times larger than the water molecules, which are in blue. So the water molecules are able to work their way through the grains of the wood at a faster rate than the ethanol molecules. And this is why a lot of times you'll notice that your product actually will go up in ethanol content, mostly because it loses more water than it, than it loses uh, ethanol. 
But as we start to, to lose this and we get this, this uh, vapor pressure space within our barrel, this also allows for more kind of mixing through way of convection. And this also does play a role into the flavors and how they develop in our, in our beer and how fast they come out of the wood. I have heard of people aging their barrels on their roofs or in their parking lots. Uh, if they're secure, I guess it works. <laughs> um, uh, and so that way uh, they're subject to the bright, bright, crazy sunlight during the day, but then they cool off at night. Um, I, I've heard of people doing that. So, and of course, if you have a controlled environment, if you have a controlled uh, room where you're doing your aging in, uh, you can control a lot of this on your own. You can increase the temperature a little bit for a certain amount of time and then decrease the temperature and let it go through those cycles. And that's exactly how the aging process works with a lot of bourbons and whiskeys, uh, especially like we were talking about Kentucky and Tennessee. The summertime comes and it heats all those barrels up in all the warehouses and then it cools down uh, in the wintertime and has those, those aging cycles year after year. So to kind of put some things sort of all together here, uh, you know, the, the marvel of maturation as it can be called sometimes, um, we have our char layer. Our char layer breaks down um, the composition of the wood and gives us, it creates more surface area with the product. It gives us that, um, for all those profiles and flavors that develop from the breakdown of it but it also gives us the subtractive effect, um, uh, effects where uh, the bottom left-hand corner, how that charcoal acts as a filter and actually pulls out undesirable flavors from the product. Just like how I mentioned earlier, anyone who has a water filter at their kitchen sink, chances are that's a charcoal water filter because it works really well as a filtering agent to remove impurities. Our angel share is what's gonna be uh, is, is what we're going to lose. It's going to evaporate through the wood. And um, especially if you're in a hotter and or drier atmosphere, you're going to lose more. Luckily with beer, we don't tend to lose too, too much because we're aging for shorter periods of time and the beer is much more viscous. So it doesn't soak through the wood as fast as a high proof whiskey would, but it's still something we have to worry about. And again, when we lose our angel share, we gain oxygen. And the oxygen is going to start to slowly seep its way in, especially with this uh, vapor space that we now developed in the wood. Now, our extraction, the product's going to soak into the wood, pick up all those flavors, and then work its way back out and keep on doing this repeatedly over and over and over again. That's the aging process. And then we're also going to have all of the flavors, the additive, the, the flavors that this extraction process then puts into our beer and puts into our products that we have in this barrel, our wood, our caramel, almonds, maple, smoke, all the, 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 the um, vanillins uh, and, all, and all that is what we're going to gain throughout this whole big uh, cycle of a process here. So um thank you guys uh for for all that um we are finishing just a tad bit early generally it's an hour long but also i'm used to doing this in front of people where i get to throw things at you and also uh do a lot of q a we don't get to do that unfortunately here um so we got a little be a little creative um you know thank you so much uh to andrew for putting this on and obviously we you know we can't join in person at a lot of at a lot of the big trade shows much like cbc and all that which is why we, we have these great virtual events that uh, kind of, I think, do a great job filling the gap. But the biggest thing is swag. What is a trade show without walking around in what I like to call adult trick-or-treating and picking up swag? So um, we've got a bunch of gifts. And like I said, um, we don't have to wear masks, luckily, here in our virtual event. But if you are looking to get your own cover your bunghole mask, uh, as seen here, uh, or uh, all the rest of the swag that we have. We do have a swag bag that we've put together for everybody. So uh, email me at matt at riverdrive.co, matt at riverdrive.co. Send me your name, send me your address. We'll get you a cover your bunghole mask. 
we'll get you some swag. But also, if you have any questions related to the presentation or not, um, it doesn't matter if there's any way I can help you guys with your aging, uh, please let me know, reach out, uh, and, and we'll definitely get, uh, whether it's a, a phone call or an email or a text message, you name it, how, whatever works for you, we'll get you set up, we'll get you taken care of, and we'll get you, get that aging program, take off for you. Thanks, guys. You know, I guess we may have a little bit extra uh, time here. Um, so we do have viewers on. Uh, uh, thank you for, for tuning in to the presentation. Um, and actually what I can do here is I can show you um, the Barrels Direct website. And this way you can really get a, a good view of uh, really the resources are the most important part um, on here. So the Resources tab here really uh, show just the amount of stuff on here and everything from our up and coming barrel manager program, other, more classes and education, shipping logistics. We explain our fiber infusion technology to really truly customize your barrel aging. Now we also have a bunch of cooperage videos and other oak, inform oak aging information that actually a lot of it we covered right here uh, our five-point barrel inspection process, which we're going to demonstrate later on about 4.50 tonight, um, and, and tons of stuff here. To go over to our overview, for those interested, um, it just kind of spells it all out in all the different formats, a lot of exactly what we talked about here, from chips, cues, mini barrels, all the way up to full size. And, of course, our Cooperage videos, where you get to see my face on your computer screen. Again, you're welcome or I'm sorry, either way. <laughs> um, some really good downloads here, the five-step inspection process, barrel anatomy. Um, it's just really good ways to, to really uh, maximize your, your barrel aging program and to the, really to the best of uh, anyone's ability and make you an expert in no time. I by no means am an expert, but my goal is to make you an expert. <laughs> so. Our videos uh, outline our barrel inspection process, goes over our barrel anatomy, and also down here explains our cooperage kit. Our cooperage kit is a toolkit that we put together uh, to really help you guys out, uh, address almost any issue that you may come across while working with your barrel program and, uh, and, and going through uh, inspecting your barrels, fixing leaks, uh, fixing uh, stuff, so on and so forth. So. That is all that. Uh, feel free to click around the website, barrelsdirect.com. You can shop around. There's over 200 different types of barrels listed here on any given moment from all around the world. It's a lot of fun. It's, uh, it's a daunting task to keep up the inventory, but it is a lot of fun. We do have some really cool ones like these pink tequilas, which is part of our benefit barrel uh, program, which the pink tequila barrels in particular a pro portion of the proceeds go towards breast cancer awareness awareness we do a number of different benefit barrels we have big barrels small barrels five gallon all the way up to huge uh, uh floaters and tanks as you can all see down the left side here so that's about as much plugging as i'm going to do for myself <laughs> but um, i really just wanted to show this to you guys so you could really get a good idea of the resources that were available we have the barrel blog up here on the top right and this is a bunch of our travels uh, and a bunch of the stuff. My favorite one, Embrace the Taint. Not favorite in the way that it's destroying the wine industry, but it's not every day you get to use that title. Um, and that refers to smoke taint in the, the wine, uh, what the wine industries are dealing with right now with all the wildfires. But also, we've got all of our travels and all of our other programs that we've done here. Tons of blogs, really good pictures. Um, I certainly recommend at least reading through that. And you can also join our mailing list 
and get live updates of any time we get new and fresh barrels in. Generally, once a week, we'll send an update out with the newest and the freshest that we have. All right. Thank you guys again. Appreciate it. And I will shut up for good this time. Promise. Cheers.